Hi, welcome to our series of one-on-one -on -one conversations with Irish women architecture around the globe. This is part of the RAI Women in Architecture 2020 series, uh, which unfortunately we can't hold in Marion Square this year, but I think we have another dimension of going around the globe to talk to our colleagues to see what they are up to. The first person that I'm going to speak to is Sarah McGann, um, who is Professor and Dean of Arts and Sciences at the University of Notre Dame in Fremantle, Australia. Sarah's research builds upon her own research and practice background, particularly with the social life of buildings. And she has a special interest and expertise in the design of well-being, aging, and palliative care. So welcome, Sarah. Firstly, maybe you, you can maybe you could tell us a little bit about um, how you became an architect and the early part of your career. Um, <clears throat> well, it does seem like a fairly long time ago. So uh, I went through Bolton Street, like you did, and um, worked for in Ireland for about uh, t ten or more years. In mainly in Burke Kennedy Doyle, but also in Keen Murphy Duff briefly and uh, John Hainahan Architects briefly. But most of my work was done in Burke Kennedy Doyle. Um, and then um, we took the decision to move to Australia and I took the decision to enter um, what I thought would be part time work in a university and naively found out it was very full time work in a university and spent the last 25 years doing that. Very good. So, and did you start teaching in studio or lecturing? Yeah, did you yeah I, started doing, I started doing a bit of everything. I did studio, I did um, tech, technology, did professional practice, um, and uh, also supervised dissertations and honours thesis and um, those sorts of things. Okay. And how big, how big is the School of Architecture in Fremantle? Would it be so, an Irish school or much bigger? Well, I, re I moved recently, well, as in I moved about six years ago to Notre Dame. Before that, I was at Curtin University, which is huge. Um, so I was head of, I ended up being head of architecture there and interior architecture as one department. And that was, um, we had about 900 students all up. And we had campuses running in Hong Kong, Malaysia, Singapore, um, and so programs running there as well. So I left there in 2014 and joined Notre Dame um, as Dean of Arts and Science there, which didn't have an architecture program. So, so I got the uh, once in a lifetime opportunity to design your own program. And so started one um, last year and we have the first graduates of the Masters of Architecture program graduating this year. So we've got a brand new program, brand new staff, and a um, completely different sort of take on architectural education, I guess. So very that, different. That, yeah, that, that, that's, that's really interesting. So you had your first, into, and you're running, is, is it a bachelor's and a master's or is it? No, we, we started with the master's. So here the accreditation is accredits the masters only and the university decide what pathway the students would take into the masters. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I decided we do a masters only and we basically take graduates of a bachelor of architecture into the masters. And then we, that way we'd get accreditation as soon as possible and we'd be able to sort of see how it, how it works. So that's what we did. We got, um, a very small cohort of about 12 students that came in full time, about 16 all up, but about 12 full time that came in from other bachelors and uh, they're all ready to graduate with about 20 coming through the following year. Um, and now next year we start the bachelor. So we build our own sort of feeder path into the masters. And is that like a year, it's a three year to bachelor and two year masters? Yeah, that? three plus two, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly the same. So yeah, so the bachelor kicks off next year. We've just written it, got it, got it through, and are started marketing, marketing now. And I guess the point of difference for for the program that I've started is that it, um, the masters about a quarter of the program is run in practice. So you're embedded in practice each semester um, with a practice partner and a mentor, and you complete your. Um, technology end of the masters in practice. 
Right. And then you do, you do the studio in, on campus and you do the other units, the research-based um, culture units on campus. Okay. So it's, uh, it's designed so that you can work in practice and study at the same time. And, and, and we facilitate that. Okay, and people, while they're working in practice, are they being paged? To, to no, no, not necessarily. Um, it's actually the reverse. Because of the um, Fair Work Australia um, rules on unpaid internships, we went the completely different route. So we actually pay the practice partners for the supervision of the students. Mm -hmm. So they basically run the tutorial, if you like, in um, practice and they mark up the students' work. So it's an education experience, not for the benefit of the practice. It's for the benefit of the student. Mm -hmm. So the supervisor is paid as a staff member. Um, and so we have, um, I rang about 45 practices before I started it and said, you know, hey, would you like to be a practice mentor, practice partner, take a student? And they all said yes. In fact, we got, we got people ringing us and saying, how come I didn't get a student? Um, <laughs> we had more practice partners than we had students. Okay. So, um, yeah, so it's a very carefully designed program because it's got to meet the accreditation um, requirements yeah. in that unit. So all the technology-based ones. So the first semester they do a design development, second semester documentation, third semester um, professional practice, and fourth semester practice management. So each semester has got a different um, focus. Yeah. And they can do it all two years in one practice, or they can go into four different types and sort of experience the whole range if they want. Well, that's a and so, patient really, isn't it? Um, and in terms of really learning the practicalities and the realities yeah, of practice. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and because we're a small scale, we can do that. The, you know, the previous institution I was at was so large, it would have been quite unmanageable to do, to do that. Mm -hmm. So we've really focused on a small cohort and that and the practice partners were involved in the design of the curriculum they're they're really engaged in the program um you know some of them are interested in doing research and further study and things like that mm -hmm. so and it's the draw card for the students they graduate from a two-year master's with two years working in different practices so they've got something on their cv they've got some drawing sets you know those sorts of things so um that's basically the, the sort of winning ticket of the program, if you like. There's a couple of questions that kind of spring to mind on that. I mean, one, I suppose, because of the cyclical nature of architectural practice and how closely tied it is to the economy. I know in Ireland, we've seen these huge peaks and troughs of employment yeah. of architects. I mean, that's, that's one perhaps risk factor in, in that type of education. Well, it, it's actually the reverse, because what happens is when there's a trough, um, you get a lot of inquiries from people working in practices to want to know if they can come and teach and take time out to come and teach. This allows them the opportunity to teach, but without leaving their office, if you like. Um, and so they get, you know, a, some amount of money. We've done it so that they, they can end up with pairs or even four students um, and they get paid per student. So they can run mini groups within studio or within a technical focus within the practice. So, um, most of the practices are really like that. So they can, you, we either pay the practice themselves or we pay the individual supervisor for the supervision. Okay. So we took the model from, Notre Dame is very well known for its education and its nursing. They, they were their flagship programs and they're considered the best in the country. And for those, we actually pay for the practicums. So all our students do practicums and it's in the professions, it's a paid practicum. So we pay for them to supervise them through particular marking up the work, aligning it with the accreditation competencies and coming to study, coming to the university for seminars where mm -hmm. the work is presented and the practice partner and the student jointly present, present the work that they've been going through. Um, and they've different models. If there's low work in the practice, then it may be that the student brings their own project with them to the practice. Mm -hmm. Or if we have some students who've transferred from an interior qualification who are doing their master's of architecture and they're also running their own interior firm. So they bring their own project and they set up a, a, a pairing with the architect's office mm -hmm. and the interior office and they work and develop that as a sort of a body of evidence. So if there isn't a lot of work in the, in the practice, you know, um, 
they, it can be done through kind of very project-based work then. Yeah, or well, they could bring their studio day. project with them. Yeah. And develop up an element of that. Yeah. Through, right through to, uh, you know, documentation. So the practice has been really supportive of it. Um, yeah. They're delighted to have the students. Many of them have then gone on to pay for extra days of the student working just generally in the office. I was going to ask. Of them, yeah. yeah. Or even and, and they've on. also gone up afterwards in between yeah. semesters. They've kept them on full time in the breaks. Yeah. And, you know, so the students are getting some good experience, really good experience. Absolutely. And I don't know if you're familiar with Fremantle itself, but it's a... Um, it's a heritage listed um, town and it's basically Western Australia's wall to wall architects. You, you, you can't walk down the street without tripping over a bunch of them. So <laughs> they literally go to work in the practice and then walk four doors up and come to the studio. So it's, it's very much town and gown together. Like they're right in amongst it. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, probably Kerry Hill is one of the most famous um, Western Australian architects and you know his office is across the road mm -hmm. so we you know we've got a student working in there and you know there's a student basically in every office around around Fremantle. Yeah and do you take in um, a proportion then of non-Australian students? Well we've got one coming this year I've got a Norwegian boy who's uh, signed up mm -hmm. um, and I've got an applicant from St Petersburg in Russia who found us um, online because essentially the the residency visas for Australia if you do a two-year program in Australia you qualify for applying for permanent residency oh. so um, that gives students a kind of an impetus to want to come and study and mm. but then also to have the networks and the practice um, experience is yeah. really attractive so I think it's also the scale. We're very small um, in Australian terms. I mean, I know that when we went through Bolton Street, it was like 40 per year. And I think UCD is still only 50 something. In Australia, you can have first year of 150, 200 students. Mm -hmm. So it's massive. Whereas we're aiming at the 40. Yeah. So we haven't got there yet. We're still only 20. But I think, uh, the, just the... Um, the kind of the the non non national whatever country you're in student cohort, and um, certainly in Ireland, seems to contribute a huge amount of finance to third level institutions because they are paying yeah. far more than the the, yeah. the the local people to go to college there. I know my son did a semester in Melbourne in the School of Architecture there, and there was quite a lot of uh, non Australian people. Probably about thirty or forty percent. Yeah, um, Melbourne Uni Melbourne would have been one would be one of the big ones for sure. Yeah, and and, Victor, and the whole of Victoria is pretty focused. Like a lot of particularly Southeast Asian students want to come to Melbourne because it's a, a buzzy place. Um, Fremantle's a little bit um, smaller, and so not quite doesn't have quite the same buzz of, of Melbourne. But we have a, you know a reasonable amount that come to Western Australia. But Notre mm -hmm. Dame itself hasn't really been in the international market to date. So, because I think I think the, the third level institutions that do rely on the international market are going to be particularly badly affected now. And Australia oh, has massive, been very yeah. strict about, as you say, even Western Australia is kind of closed up, but the whole of Australia absolutely, yeah, yeah it's it's really tough, particularly students, international students who are halfway through their program and they can't get back. Um, you know, they've been working really hard to do online learning, but it, it you know, it's it they want to come back. So um, I think they're doing deals, particularly with um, New South Wales and, and Queensland, they're doing deals to let the students back in. Um, mm -hmm. They've got a quarantine and those sorts of things. But um, yeah, we, we don't have a, a huge international market. So, um, but it doesn't mean that we won't suffer from post COVID because it means everybody's looking for the same domestic students. Yeah. So you've really got to have the point of difference. Mm -hmm. So, um, so certainly our practice placement um, is a is a is a big one, and that's when talking to the students about why they chose to come to study with us. That's the single biggest reason. Yeah, yeah. I mean, other also the small classes. They they find they're getting lost in the big classes, and you know, studios of sixty or a hundred. Mm -hmm. So ours with a studio of twenty is is pretty tiny. 
Yeah, and I can see that from going around the schools of architecture in Ireland, visiting end of year shows and even having the opportunity to attend for crits, which has been fantastic. You can mm. see the dynamic of a, an architectural studio is really important. The numbers are too small. It's difficult to get that dynamic. And if it's too big, it, it also gets lost. Um, mm. And that, um, that, that interaction with your peers and with the staff is so important as well. Yeah, we found we've joined the two studios together the, the first year and the second year of the Masters. And they've come to the crits of both. And they're, you know, so they're sort of like one big cohort, if you like. Yeah. Um, and then we've got a lot of the, the young graduate architects who come in as reviewers and those sorts of things and other practitioners. Because it's just down the road. They're yeah. happy to drop in kind of thing. So. so can I ask you then about the gender balance in architectural education in your school and generally in Australia? How is, how is that? Um, in student terms, it's probably 50-50. Um, and I think at Notre Dame it's probably a little bit more male than female, maybe 60, 40, um, which is interesting because Notre Dame being, it's big two programs being nursing and, ed and education is quite female. So um, it, it's good to have, you know, a few more folks in the, uh, in the course. Um, Staff-wise, we're, we're a little bit skewed in the gender balance, as in we've got uh, six of us and only one bloke. <laughs> so there's <laughs> quite a lot of women. Um, yeah. But we, we, make, we make up for it with the, with the guest reviewers and things like that, so that we get a good bit of gender balance. Is it something and I think, that you're aware of and conscious of, or is it something that doesn't even come into you it's just oh look it, it's it's really changed in the time i've been in education it's really changed from being heavily male dominated to much more senior leadership in women um so the uwa which is the one of the other schools in in western australia kate's the dean there um and the previous dean at curtin university was also female she subsequently left but at one point the three of us were three women leading leading mm. all the architecture programs and i think uni melbourne um rmit monash they they've all got female heads mm. Mm. so there's really strong balance and do um, you track your education. do you track your graduates i know your school is only new but but even in, in previous years to do, do a follow through because it's one of the big um, difficulties that I'm sure you're aware of is the fact that so, you know, well, there might be 50 50 in the schools when it, it comes yeah, to the registration goes down. Yeah, yeah. And, and certainly as in, in the RAI, the retirement category is only something like 9% women um, of retired architects and it yeah. will change as time goes on. And that's still a problem in Australia. The, um, the number of women that don't register that continue to work maybe, but in the background and don't actually register, that's a, that is a real problem. Um, and the number of women principals in larger companies is, is problematic. Mm -hmm. um, we have a group here called Parla, um, which has been really working on the gender equity and the gender balance and the seniority and the seniority within um, practices and within education. So that's going for about 10 years and that's been really successful. Yeah, in getting something happening with that. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah, so um, yeah, I think it's. I mean, certainly, I was the first female head at Curtin University, and I was the first female dean at Notre Dame. So um, I think we've got a lot of firsts yeah. <laughs> happening, <laughs> and we've had our first female president in of the institute in Western Australia. Okay. Um, so we're getting there. Yeah, it's slow. <laughs> it is slow. I'm, it hoping, is slow. I'm hoping we're going to see an, an acceleration in the next couple of years, Sarah. You know, it was so slow. And, you know, I've written a bit about and researched a bit about, you know, the first woman or, uh, member of the RAI. And then the next one was like 20 something years later. And then, <laughs> you know, like when I was president, I was only the third, even though the Institute has been yeah. around around since you know 1839 yeah. so it's well we've only had the one <laughs> so, so, so yeah there's lots of, yeah. lots of doors 
that we that need a little something stuck in them to keep them open, you know, so that we can keep this, you know, these women. Yeah, and I, I think education is is fine. It's doing, you know, it's really it's really women have excelled in, in education in architecture in the last probably ten years. It it used to be when we'd have a uh, an accreditation visit that um, you, you, you know, you'd have to rally around to make sure all the female uh, sessional staff were in because otherwise it would look very blokey. Yeah. Um, but by the time I left, it, it was predominantly quite a lot of senior women. And um, yeah, it was much more balanced. Yeah. I think, the, you know, some of, the, some of the different subjects attract different people, like the, the sort of architectural science tended to be pretty um, blokey. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I went to an architectural science conference once and there was only two women at the conference. We had a toilet each during the break. So, <laughs> you know, it was a whole conference was blokes and, uh, yeah. That's interesting. you know, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I think different sections within the, um, you know, design studio, there's a lot of women, um, history theory, a lot of women, research um, and leadership. But I think there's a middle ground where people aren't getting made to associate professor or senior lecturer. There's a, there's a lot of lecturer level, yeah. sort of entry level. Um, so there's that middle, missing middle. Yeah, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of women in Ireland certainly running very successful small practices and you yeah. know, really beautiful yeah. work. Um, but and then we have a lot of sort of husband yeah. and wife teams, mm -hmm. you know, um, very successful, very beautiful, um, but not so much where you've got really um, predominant women in the large sort of um, global practices. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're a little bit, you know, I think there's work to be done there. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, look, we might just finish off. I mean, if you have you anything that you feel is your next project or what, what you'd like oh, to well, do? Oh, well, my, next, my or... next project is uh, to get the bachelor off the ground mm -hmm. um, and, you know, try to get attract international students and students from across the country to that. Um, and we're trying a, a kind of a new approach to a bachelor as well. Again, it's different to everyone else's. We're putting a minor within the architecture, a complementary minor, so that you can do a bachelor of arts architecture, but with a minor in, and you can choose from things like um, environmental science, archaeology, history, um, Aboriginal studies, social justice, Very interesting. Um, economics and business. You know, depending on what sort of an architect you see yourself being, you can take an extra, yeah. you know, add up those courses to, to make a minor. And that way, when you come to the masters, everyone has got like different specialties yeah. with a different area of focus. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that'll be a little bit different. I, I think there's a problem of attrition after a bachelor and not much you can do with it because you're not an architect, but you're also not qualified in many other areas. So mm -hmm. this is, this is to, to give a rounded built environment. So if you wanted to go and work in government, for instance, and you've got some, a politics minor or major and architecture or journalism and architecture or mm -hmm. film and architecture. So you can get this kind of two things going together, which will increase your, um, you know, your career choices down the track, as well as allowing you to go into the masters. But I think it also, um, I think that's fantastic. I think you've hit the nail on the head about that exit after three years and, and, and what we're qualified what are you to do. do. And I mean, the architectural training is wonderful training, but it's quite non-specific and quite poorly understood by, yeah. by people. Outside and of there's a lot of stuff we're doing to do with computer programs or drawing skills. It's a lot of skills based stuff that um, is taught at quite a high cost to yeah. the student. Yeah. Um, whereas some of the other subjects, it's not the sort of thing that you can, you can pick up with a, yeah. you know, a software package. Um, so this is kind of looking at a different way of teaching the program. So yeah, that those, I, I also those think skills that, can be done differently. Yeah. And I also think the profession needs to have that variety of skills at its fingertips because you know, a, a one size fits all type of architect is not what we need. I mean, we will, we do yeah. absolutely need the really good designers. I mean, the people who are just passionate about design and, and yeah. but we also need the people who can manage the practices and who can negotiate exactly. with clients and negotiate with government and, 
lead policy and you know you have to yeah. have them. So that's the, that's the point of the bachelor is that you'll be able to do that. And we'll run workshops without grading how well people can draw or how well they can drive a BIM or how they, how, you know, we don't need to grade that. They can just learn that. You know, we can throw on workshops with, from our master's students to, to run drawing classes, but we don't actually need to grade it. Mm -hmm. um, so if you can come out with a qualification that gives you multiple pathways and gives the architecture outward focus, but also the graduates an out, outward focus of which one of those is do a master's and become an architect. The other might be work for the local county council and, and do, um, you know, urban design type projects mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever. Yeah. So I think it, it'll be interesting to see how it goes. We're, we're um, setting the bar quite high in terms of intake so that they're well qualified students coming in. Um, and again, keep this cohort small so that we can keep the quality high. Yeah. Excellent. Sounds like it sounds like a really, really great course, Sarah. And I didn't know that much about it, so really, really. Good. Yeah, no. yeah, we're not that great at marketing it, but you know. No. Well, we might I, get a few Irish exchanges. I would love to see some some people from the schools of architecture in Ireland. Well, hopefully they will listen to this conversation, and it may um, may take them a little bit along the road in terms of because architectural education, you know, it it does need to to change and adapt. Um, that's right, yeah. I mean, not radically, and, but it, 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 that whole thing of that link of practice is so essential. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's just difficult to manage unless you kind of uh, plan it within. It's difficult to sort of retrofit it afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, it, it needs to be planned fundamentally and with the practices behind it. Yeah. So, and the practices have been, have been amazing, just crying out for it. They can't, they can't give enough time. I mean, we had our, you know, end of year exhibition. We had... I think we had 16 students and 150 practitioners turned up. So, you know, it just shows you the level of interest to see what this new model is doing. Yeah, yeah of course. Could okay. have been the free wine, of course. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> okay, well, listen, we'll, let's, All right. let's finish up there. So that, that was fantastic. And uh, we look forward to hearing more from you on the 9th of July with the other five Great. lists. And uh, we'll talk to you then. All right, Bye. thanks, Karen. Thank you. See you. Bye.